the high failure rate of research and development. I'm going to cover a couple of points. I'm going to go over the main points right away and then go into more detail. And the first point is one often will hear in certain contexts that the failure rate of research and development, science and technology, startup high tech companies is something in the range of 80 to 90 percent. Most often the context in which one hears this is when something has gone wrong. A project has failed, there's been huge cost and schedule overruns, the startup went bankrupt, uh, grossly disappointing results. You know, some areas of research have promised, you know, cancer was a good example back in the 70s. We were on the verge of the cure for cancer. It was caused by retroviruses. There was a whole bunch of hype. War on cancer results were very disappointing. In fact, the official numbers show death rates for cancer rising until the mid-90s. They've improved somewhat over the last 25 years or so, but it's still obviously very disappointing. This is the context in which one hears about the 80 to 90 percent failure rate most of the time. And it is to say, well, it's bad luck. That's the way things work. And actually, you should expect that. Send more money. <laughs> Another point is that if, the, if what you call success in scientific research is the publication of peer-reviewed journal articles, then most government-funded research, most big name research, most big universities, Harvard, Caltech, all of these kind of places, the success rate is very high. Probably most of them, including those which have produced very disappointing results, have published many papers. Practical success, things like curing cancer, for example, are much rarer. And it's here where one could say the practical failure is common. Is it 80 to 90 percent? I'll argue that it depends on what you're doing and history, and it isn't clearly 80 to 90 percent. There's actually evidence, and I'll go into this in more detail, from the history of major breakthroughs and inventions, like you know, the Wright brothers with the airplane, or you know, many examples like this, that there was virtually a 100% failure rate up until the key breakthrough, the insight, or some new enabling technology, like better internal combustion engines, played a big role in powered flight and being able to actually fly that until something like that happened, actually every attempt failed for most practical purposes. There's a considerable difference in how success is presented. S success, whether it's real or imagined, faked, is usually attributed to first and foremost the genius, the, the, the deep genius of the inventors or discoverers. Also hard work and training, both academic or personal skill, Luck doesn't seem to play much of a role. You can find a few examples of people who've actually said, I was lucky. Some of that appears to be sort of feigned modesty. They don't really think that. They're not really telling you that. But they know that if they just said, I have the greatest thing since sliced bread, that might not go over so well. Probably some people are being honest that they think luck was a significant factor. This, this difference between how the failures are discussed in terms of bad luck, in terms of a high failure rate, versus the successes leads to a kind of contradictory thinking in all of us, or many of us, about the risks and possibilities of research projects. And people can simultaneously maintain these two beliefs, that the successes are sort of predictable, and they're the results of predictable things, like how smart people are, how hard they work, their technical knowledge on the one hand, and on the other hand, the notion that, well, there's you know a lot of luck, I mean, 80 to 90% failure rates, you know, just because we didn't deliver on our promise or we went 50 times over budget or, or any of these kind of things, that's just to be expected, yeah, you know, send more money. Uh, venture capitalists often give similar numbers, as I mentioned, 80 to 90 percent failure rates. That's almost certainly true for startup companies, and they also tend to do the same thing, right? The failures are sort of bad luck. It's just part of the game, but we make it up with Google or we make it up with Sun Microsystems back in the 90s and 80s or other companies, you know, like Microsoft. And of course, the successes are brilliant people, hard work, all these predictable things. There isn't much question that the practical successes are relatively rare, especially like the big breakthroughs, the inventions. But it's not clear how much. The rates probably vary. So when you're dealing with very sort of difficult problems, 
then the failure rates may actually be until that key breakthrough, that insight or new technology or new material was discovered, there's a lot of indications that it's closer to 100%. Um, just to give a specific example, attempts to develop powered aircraft basically failed until the early 1900s. Uh, it's usually attributed to the Wright brothers, the, the patents and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is human power plight was impractical despite Leonardo da Vinci's famous you know, drawings. And internal combustion engines, steam engines just weren't powerful enough to get people airborne. And Octave Chanute, who did a, a big historical study of all the attempts to figure out how to fly, he was a sort of mentor of the Wright brothers. He's often forgotten today, but he wrote a book, Progress in Flying Machines, about all of this. And essentially, he basically cites a couple of cases of what sound like successful gliders. They weren't really powered aircraft. There was a guy in Renaissance Italy that it sounds like actually built a working glider and was able to fly you know, a couple of miles before it crashed, and I think he broke his leg or something like that. Now, there's a couple of less clear accounts of sort of wizards back in like the Middle Ages who, again, sounds like maybe they built some kind of glider. But actual powered aircraft, whether man-powered or some kind of machine, it may be nobody had ever done it before 1908 or 1903. 1903 is usually when they say the Wright brothers did it. But within a few years, it became feasible because the power, the internal combustion engines became much more powerful. They were going up exponentially in power and, and power to weight ratio during this period from the late 1800s up into at least the 1950s. And that made possible a lot of things that we take for granted today, including plane flight. So those are my major points that I want to make. I want to go into a little bit more detail on some of the culture and how we think about this high failure rate, which I touched on. So let me go back to the point of that 80 to 90 percent failure rate is usually quoted in the context of justifying projects that are disappointing, which are many actually that have large cost and schedule overruns or are you know grossly disappointing. You know what they said they were going to do versus what actually happened are really really different and disappointing. That happens frequently in research. And when it gets questioned, like when somebody, whether it's graduate students who are disappointed with what happened in their research program or getting their PhD, something that happened to me, or, you know, the general public, I mean, many, many situations where people are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you told us this. The scientists or the agencies or entities will flip and often with some degree of disdain say, well, you know, 80 to 90 percent of these projects fail. You knew that. And, you know, if you want better results, give us even more money because then you get more of that 5 or 10 percent that uh, don't fail, that are big successes. You know, the Manhattan projects, the uh, you know, development of penicillin. These are a couple of World War II era examples of seemingly spectacular successes in research and development. And so once they've quieted everybody down with the 80 to 90 percent, then they go back to, well, you know, Einstein is so smart, you know, Feynman is so smart, uh, the Bright Brothers were so smart. It's, it's really, we're, we're super smart, we went to the right schools, we worked super hard, you know, 80-hour weeks, all this kind of stuff. And so then it becomes predictable. And they focus, again, on these spectacular but rare successes to justify funding and public confidence in uh, some project. A you know, current example, which we hope will work out good, is the Operation Warp Speed, the new vaccines for COVID. But they're tapping into this same history, and if things, things go really wrong, we'll probably get to hear about how research fails at a high rate. One thing they don't do is say, well, you know, 80 to 90% failure rate is pretty high. Maybe we're funding a lot of unnecessary projects and people. You could reach that conclusion. And when they're telling how smart they are, and I've seen this in actual, I can show you examples of reports and things talking about this. So like, all the research is really done by this 1% of supermen. And, and, you know, which of course could mean that, well, just get rid of the rest of the 99% and just go with the 1% supermen, and then we won't have an 80 to 90% failure rate. We'll get the same or better bang for the buck out of much less research money. You very rarely will hear that argument. They don't go that way. But you could actually, can actually make that argument that the 80 to 90% failure rate is because lots of, you know, projects which are very unlikely to succeed, keep getting funded, and even historically, but especially with big science and big technology today. But you very rarely hear that argument. Now, what does one, as a, what about, what exactly is success? 
Well, in the modern sort of post-World War II era, where most research is funded, it's very big scale. Most of it is funded by governments like the U.S. government agencies like the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, NASA, DOD, the Department of Defense in the U.S. funds a lot of this kind of research. An awful lot is actually funded by the government. Industry tends to fund more applied research, and the government tends to fund more basic, quote, basic research. In this time period, huge amounts of money are spent, and everybody produces what are called peer-reviewed journal articles. Big name journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association or New England Journal of Medicine. Or there's all sorts of them. There's little tiny ones. Um, so the reality is that this big time research that's mostly funded by the government, sometimes by big corporations or foundations, but it's mostly the government that pays for it, is published. Even if the results are very disappointing, even if they went way over budget, even if there were all kinds of problems, it is published in peer-reviewed journals. And the, the peer-reviewed journal article may just say we were unable to do this or words to that effect. In particle physics, where I got my PhD, what they love to do is we, we have placed an energy limit on, say, supersymmetry or one of these things. With our current accelerator, we can't find it. And if you just give us more money to build an even bigger accelerator, maybe we'll find it. So they, they express it as a lower bound on the energy the mass of the particles they're looking for, supersymmetry, or candidates for dark matter in cosmology slash particle physics. There are different kinds of things like this. So you can almost always produce a published peer-reviewed paper, at least if you have a lot of government money and you're at Harvard or Caltech or many other places, and it'll say basically in very, you know, nice words, we couldn't find what we were looking for. Obviously, this is not what we really mean by success. So there's a notion maybe of a practical success, like something really substantial. And it's easiest with inventions, with, with tools or technologies that benefit us in a very direct way, like a cure for a disease or penicillin being one of the famous examples of this, or the development of other antibiotics would be an example of this. Uh, indoor plumbing actually had enormous, we believe, enormous, enormous benefits in reducing disease and death in the 20th century. But it tends not to get hyped the way antibiotics do or vaccines do. So practical success seems to be pretty rare. Now, there are certainly spectacular examples of this. There are a number from World War II, the most prominent and influential being the Manhattan Project, which developed the first, as far as we know, atomic power, atomic reactors, uranium bombs, plutonium bombs, seemingly discovered plutonium, uh, hitherto unknown, isotope, isolated uranium-235, which is the explosive kind of uranium used in bombs and so on. And it went on to be, that program went on to be very successful for probably another 15 or 20 years into the early 1960s with the development of hydrogen bombs and thermonuclear weapons, which were a thousand times, a thousand times more destructive than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, much more powerful and they involved in, in uh, an initial discovery, you know, fusion control, sort of controlled fusion power. And then, you know, the rate of progress in these nuclear atomic areas almost plateaued. I mean, um, we, we haven't seen, you know, anything like the progress people were expecting in the 50s and early 60s in this field. And in fact, fields that kind of grew out of it or sprouted from it, like particle physics, have generally had very disappointing practical successes. And, um, and they frequently had huge cost and schedule overruns, like happened with the Large Hadron Collider. It happened to me for the project that I worked on as my, a graduate student. It's happened many other times. And the results have been eh, nothing really spectacular. I mean, um, you know, a lot of these things, it's like supersymmetry that they hypothesized. They haven't been able to find. They keep looking for them. My point is, you know, practical success is indeed rare. And our understanding of what produces that practical success is probably not very good, even among the, quote, experts. So, for example, the people who did the Manhattan Projects and so on, and their students and student students and so on, it's just kind of plateaued. And there's often an S-curve where you have a period where, with aircraft, for example, where virtually no progress up until the early 1900s, when the internal combustion engines, for example, became much better. And then you see exponential growth for a while. You know, exponential growth, and then it tends to plateau again. And that happened with air aircraft. I mean, aircraft, the performance of aircraft went through the roof between 1900 and sort of the night about 1970, about when we landed on the moon. And then it's been pretty flat. It's very disappointing in the last, 
you know, 40 or 50 years. And that's not uncommon. And it appears in retrospect that something like that happened with nuclear atomic particle physics. It went through this period of very rapid, very practical results. I mean, maybe frightening ones with nuclear weapons, but they really accomplished a lot and then they kind of plateaued. And that, that's very common in the history of technology. And when you're in that exponential period where the, amongst other things, the, the success rates seem to be higher during that period. And you've got this enabling technology or idea, and then there's sort of logical implications of it, things that just come together. You're a genius. You're working so hard. You're all of these things. And then you, you hit the plateau or you reach the plateau, and the, re what, the incremental improvements become extremely expensive or impossible. And that's why it's very difficult to say 80 or 90% failure rate. For example, in the S-curve, you have a 100% failure rate getting up to the S, where it climbs. During the period of exponential growth, the failure rate is clearly, the practical failure rate is considerably lower. And uh, in the last 50 years or so, certain areas of miniaturizing electronics, computers, certain algorithms like video compression have been, in, you know, a lot of progress has been made in those areas up to right now. They are probably going to plateau at some point, as often happens. So once you start to get into that plateau, the failure rate goes up, the success rate goes down. You know, these fields with these exponential growth, they attract the supposed best and brightest, right? The people with the top scores on standardized tests, the people go to the right schools, all that kind of thing. So it's not a shortage of, quote, smart people. It's not a shortage of hardworking people. It's not a shortage of skills. They're getting taught by the best and the brightest to the, to the geniuses responsible, seemingly, for that exponential growth. But it very frequently tops out. So the failure rate is dependent on where and what situation you're in in ways that we don't really, really fully understand. This reality, which actually is historically demonstrable, there's a lot of evidence of something like this, of this sort of situation. Uh, we now know that you know the physics community was not able to reproduce the success of the Manhattan Project and its immediate follow-on projects, you know, the hydrogen bomb projects, consistently up to the present day. They largely topped out somewhere in the 60s and 70s. So we don't know the magic formula for a new Manhattan Project or something like Operation Warp Speed that's anywhere near guaranteed to produce results. It's not actually what our past experience in the last 70 years or so has shown us. Actually, it remains very unpredictable. It also means that the failure rates can change consistently across uh, different projects or different periods. So a field where you had a high, fail a high success rate, a practical success rate, can suddenly go flat and may continue to receive money because of the historical successes long after the failure rates have gone back to perhaps 100% again, right? We're on this plateau and until we have the next leap forward, the next breakthrough, the next insight, the next new material, we're not going to get anywhere. So what we should do is think consistently about these failure rates and not allow ourselves to be deceived by the 80 to 90 percent failure rate explains the failures, give us more money, and we'll sort of expand that 5 percent of successes. None of that really actually seems to work. And, oh, if we do succeed, that's because, you know, we're geniuses, we have super intelligent people, the people with IQ test results of 200, these kind of things are going to succeed. We just throw the right people with enough money. That isn't actually what you see. And, you know, we should think about this failure rate and say, well, what are we actually seeing and how likely are these projects to succeed given the failure rates we actually see? And again, there's this problem of what exactly do we mean by a failure, right? In research and development, it's, again, peer-reviewed published papers are a dime a dozen. By that criterion, there isn't this huge failure rate, even in areas that have been very disappointing. But that's not really what most of us are talking about. Most of us would like to see cures for cancer or, you know, new super efficient energy sources that you know have no negative consequences no pollution no global warming none of these concerns that we have you know the miracle technology fusion power maybe or you know some kind of solar technology that's super cheap and durable and you know basically eliminates most of the concerns that we have today whatever might and it could be anything i mean major breakthroughs are often kind of unexpected it's like an idea that somehow was ignored for years and or people just didn't think of it comes out of left field not always but that's a very common pattern especially prior to world war ii where you didn't have as much institutionalized research 
So I want to leave you in, in the context of looking at things going on like Operation Warp Speed or other, other projects, these new Manhattan projects, with the realization that the failure rates are very high, that the failure rates are not a function of how much money or how many smart people are thrown at the problem. There's evidence that they that there's a kind of a, a pattern, this S curve, it's, and you will, you know, once you get into the plateau periods, failure rates can be very, very, very high. They can be essentially a hundred percent, even though the past, tr tr the past, um, if you will, history, the the track record was really impressive for a while, and you think these people must know what they're doing and all that kind of thing, rather than that the particular technological leap forward took some cases decades or even centuries to sort of run out of steam. So always think about these high failure rates. They're usually pretty high. It's not clear they're 80 to 90 percent. And as I said, in some periods, they probably are a lot lower than 80 to 90 percent. On the other hand, in other periods, they're 100 percent. Are we spending money wisely if we're pouring money into an area where we've hit the 100 percent? I mean, it's far from clear. I mean, it's not the mechanism um, that occurs. So that concludes my uh, presentation here about the high failure rates. And there are high practical failure rates in research and development, especially during some periods. And those can occur with fields which have an impressive track record when they plateau. This concludes this video presentation. If you like this video, please click like. Please click subscribe and the notification bell if you would like to receive more content from us. You can avoid internet censorship by subscribing directly to our RSS news feed. Please consider sharing the link by email and on your website or blog, in addition to liking, upvoting, or sharing on increasingly censored, advertising beholden, big company social media. We have encountered such censorship. Mathematical software is developing algorithms and software to automate data analysis, reducing the risks of costly errors and increasing the predictive power of the results. You can support our work financially by subscribing on our Patreon page, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash mathsoft, or scanning the QR code in the lower right corner.